afternoon. Thank you for joining. This is Michelle Savage again and from Expert US. We're going to get started in our webinar right now. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining. Um, we're here to talk about data and technology transforming the financial information landscape. And we're very pleased to have with us today Mohini Singh from the CFA Institute. Um, before I go on into making introductions and talking about what we're going to cover today, um, I just want to give you a few logistical points. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of the program today. So if you have questions, please click on the Q&A link at the top of your screen, screen, and then you can submit your questions right there. And um, we'll gather those together and take them at the end of the program. Uh, today's uh, session is going to include CPE credit for some of you who are interested in getting that. Um, so at two different points during the program, we will be stopping and asking a couple of CPE questions. So if you are getting CPE, please make sure that you respond to the questions and click on the radio buttons to lodge your um, response. And then we'll get CPE uh, certificates out to those who've um, requested that in the next couple of weeks. Um, and if you have any kind of technical issues as we go through the program, please email us at support, S-U-P-P-O-R-T at X-B-R-L U-S and we'll do our best to get you back up and online again. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, jump into our program and um, we're gonna cover you know, uh, half of the program, then we're gonna stop and we have a couple of questions that we wanna, wanna talk through and, um, and then we'll cover the second half of the program with Mohini. But, but first let me, let me introduce the, the program. Um, the, the program is really designed to present a study that the CFA Institute uh, conducted and published uh, just, just five months ago. And the study is on the use of data and technology for investors. The paper examines the current financial reporting process. It looks at um, various inefficiencies that are in the system and determines the ways that data, data an analytics, and technology can improve or even transform the current process into something much better. So we felt that this was a very timely, uh, very well thought out report. And we've invited Mohini, um, who is one of the lead authors of this paper, to provide his findings to our audience today. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about Mohini, who we've known for many years now. Mohini is a director in the Financial Reporting Policy Group at the CFA Institute. Um, at the CFA, she is responsible for representing membership interests regarding financial reporting proposals of the IASB, the FASB, and other regulators. She drafts comment letters and position papers in collaboration with members of the Corporate Disclosure Policy Council. And she also serves on the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board Consultative Advisory Group and the FASB's Disclosure Framework Resource Group. So um, we're very pleased to have Mohini with us today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mohini. Thank you for that introduction, Michelle. As you just heard, I'm with CFA Institute, and I'd like to begin by uh, giving you a little bit of flavor as to who we are. CFA Institute is a global not-for-profit organization of investment industry professionals. We have about 135,000 members in 69 countries. What we are best known is for administering the CFA exam and providing the designation that is Chartered Financial Analyst. Over the years, we've also moved into the advocacy arena to advocate for policy positions on behalf of our members. So I'm here today to discuss the role of data and technology in financial reporting and why CFA Institute is advocating for improvements in this area. I will provide investors' views on why structured data is beneficial to their financial analysis. And our views are outlined in our publication, Data and Technology, Transforming the Financial Information Landscape. Next slide, please. Before I discuss this recent publication, I'd like to provide a little background as to what led to our research in this area. It actually started with a previous publication entitled financial reporting disclosures, investor perspectives on transparency, trust, and volume. And this study came out in 2013. Next slide. 
Over the last five years, the narrative being assigned to investors is that they are overloaded with information. The narrative emerged in the 2011-2012 timeframe with publications such as Cutting the Clutter, Louder Than Words, Losing the Excess Baggage. The problem was that these reports had little, if any, investor input. Only one of the UK Financial Reporting Council's reports included investor input, and they didn't see a disclosure overload issue. In one case, overload was used to explain why investors missed the financial crisis. KPMG's 2013 publication, The Future of Corporate Reporting, advanced the idea that disclosures were indeed complete before the financial crisis, and, in, and if investors had looked hard enough through the overload, they would have seen the signs. Because the publications which were framing this overload narrative excluded substantive investor input, and frankly different from what we were hearing from investors, we surveyed our members and, re and released the 2013 publication. In it, we provide our views on investor priorities versus standard setter and regulatory focus. Next slide. What was most troubling to us about the overload narrative was the fact that policymakers and regulators were not questioning it in the context of the current economic or technological environment. And what were these? Firstly, the financial crisis. In a period following the most significant crisis since the Great Depression and a period of continued economic uncertainty, the view of disclosures was one of disclosure overload instead of disclosure reform. There was little mention of or connection to the recent financial crisis and how it informed the need to improve the quality not reduce the volume of disclosures. Knowing that the Great Depression led to massive disclosure reform with the Securities Acts of 33 and 34, it struck us as particularly <clears throat> paradoxical that the disclosure overload refrain was taking hold and that the 2009 financial crisis essentially led to no substantive disclosure reform. Secondly, <clears throat> technology wasn't being discussed. Strange and most applicable to today's discussion was the fact that the disclosure overload narrative failed to consider the potential impact technology could have on the financial reporting environment and the ability of technology to mitigate this perceived information overload. None of the reports espousing the narrative talked about how technology could be used to reduce clutter. We addressed the issue in our financial reporting disclosures report because as investors, we were unable to reconcile the narrative to current events. Also in the 2011-2012 time period, the dialogue in the media was all about the rise of big data and the advances in business intelligence. When businesses are discussing the rise in information and the creation of analytical tools to harness and leverage information, the natural question for investors is, how can you tell me that I'm overloaded or confused by all this information while simultaneously talking about how information and technology are being leveraged internally to make better business decisions. Next slide, please. This survey result really says it all. Investors do not seek a reduction in the volume of disclosures. They seek enhanced quality through emphasis of matters of importance, that's the first column you see in the chart, in the reporting period, 
improved financial statement presentation, and more effective communication through the use of tables, charts, and cross-referencing. Next slide. Given the interest shown in our views on technology expressed in that paper, we decided to conduct further research. We started by looking at our historical efforts in this area. CFA Institute has long supported technology to improve the democratization of information. We supported the SEC's Edgar Initiative because we believed it would, as it has, helped make financial information more readily available to investors. In our 1993 publication, Financial Reporting in the 1990s and Beyond, we noted that it promises to be a vast improvement over the pre present system, and that it would eventually make even the most recalcitrant analyst into a database user. Over the last decade, we have provided similar support to the development of XBRL, including publishing reports such as Extensible Business Reporting Language, a guide for investors. Most recently, we have supported the European Securities and Markets Authority's efforts to establish the European Single Electronic Format. But what about our views on technology in the future? Next slide. So far, implementation of data tagging using XBRL has been seen as an extension of the financial reporting process by allowing data capture at the end of the process, making the data more flexible and interactive. We see the future as needing a discussion of how technology can be utilized not only at the end of the process, but at the very beginning to ensure greater structuring and timeliness. We need to look at how technology can be harnessed to reform the reporting process end-to-end, -end, not simply in the filing of documents with regulators. So we conducted this study to identify ways to effectively capture, manage, analyze, present, and deliver financial data. This is the reform investors see as necessary. Our research is based on interviews with analysts, preparers, auditors, data providers, and others, as well as reviewing published material on the subject. Next slide. Our study begins at the start of the reporting process. Currently, companies manually assemble and review financial reports. This requires both time and money. These processes can be enhanced by standardized, standardizing data at the point of data capture. When data are standardized, disclosure management applications can be used to pull information from different data sources and write automated reports. Such standardization not only saves companies time and resources, but also reduces errors in data because there's less manual intervention. It provides more timely information, so management can do some more real-time finan financial analysis on data than they could do before. There are many benefits. For example, it, uh, it allows management to identify anomalies, perform trend analyses, and ultimately all allocate capital more efficiently. But to achieve these benefits, Companies really need to structure data early in the process. So why isn't this happening? I believe the problem is that companies see XPRL as a compliance exercise. What most companies do is follow a two-tier process. They prepare their financial statements and then prepare their inter interactive data as an additional step to simply to fulfill their regulatory filing needs. As a result, XPRL isn't producing the intended benefits for companies. The question is, how do we overcome the, this challenge? Is it a matter of education 
I believe so. And we are one of the constituents that need to provide that education. The main message I would like to deliver to companies is that they should view this as a communication platform, not a compliance exercise. It will provide companies with the benefits I've just talked about, as well as provide investors with higher quality, more transparent, and timely information. This leads to a more efficient dialogue between companies and investors. Next slide. Auditors. Standardization of data is also essential for the audit process to become more effective. It will allow auditors to automate many manual processes. Similar to companies, audit data analytics could be used to identify risks, fraud, etc. While audit processes have certainly been improving, what is needed is for them to truly evolve. Internal audit appears to be ahead of external audit in this regard. For example, with some internal audits performing continuous auditing. For external audit to move in this direction, many things are needed. Increased education, updating of auditing standards, assurance on systems for true automation of the audit function. In fact, I'm a member of the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board Task Force that has been set up to review the international auditing standards to determine what changes need to be made. But of course, a number of questions still remain open. To allow continuous auditing, will companies permit ongoing access to their systems? If you have continuous auditing, can audit opinions be maintained on a more regular basis? More importantly, I think the question is, is there a demand for, from companies for a more effective audit or a higher level of assurance, with perhaps 100% of the population being audited? Of course, we'll never get to a true 100% as there will always be room for judgment. Next slide. If there is greater demand from companies, this is what I believe the future state could look like. We could move from historic reporting to real time, periodic to on demand, based on financial me measures, based on financial and non-financial items, backward looking versus predictive. Next slide. Let's take a look now at how investors can benefit from the use of structured data. The report lists what I see as the five main benefits. Improved accuracy, improved productivity, greater opportunity for higher returns, better risk management, empowering the analyst. In the report, and I hope you will go to it, we provide examples of each to demonstrate the point. Due to these benefits, many data providers now use XBRL as part of their data gathering. This allows for faster and more detailed information to be provided to their customers. In fact, Morningstar provides a great example of how XBRL increases productivity. According to Morningstar, it takes five days to process HTML filings and display the information for their clients, whereas aggregating XBRL data is nearly instantaneous. With the availability of XBRL and technology to sift through data, investors are now in a better position to perform faster, better analyses. Investors can research more companies, and or they can take a deeper dive into the companies they already follow. Also, many believe XBRL could bring better opportunities to small and medium-sized entities by making it easier for investors to cover these companies. 
Indeed, structured data could produce a virtuous circle. It helps companies by bringing about greater efficiencies and reducing costs. It helps investors by allowing them to make more informed investment decisions. And it brings, brings greater investment to companies that were previously not so closely followed. All of this ultimately leads to a more efficient and transparent capital markets. But of course, there are improvements that can be made. Structuring needs to be expanded to earnings releases and supplemental reporting packages that often move markets. Indeed, Hal Schroeder at the FASB in a keynote speech supported structuring of earnings releases. But of course, the FASB doesn't have the authority to mandate this. Also, there is invaluable information for investors in the MDNA, which isn't currently being structured. The question is here is what can be done to expand the use of structuring? I think I'll stop here, Michelle, and take a couple of questions. Great, thanks very much, Mohini. Um, I'm going to uh, switch slides here for a minute. And we're gonna pull up another set of slides to cover some questions. Um, so, so just building on what you were just, just talking about um, in, in terms of expanding the use of, of structured data, or the, the availability of structured data, you know, you note that um, requiring the MDNA section and other numeric data to be tagged would open up a trove of valuable data for all investors. And that's a quote directly out of the study. How would having MDNA data in structured format help investors and analysts in, in their analysis? Um, how, how are they using that data today? Okay. Well, what, what, we what we would really like is for all the numbers in the MDNA to be tagged, and we'd like text block tagging of, um, of all the text and all of all the narrative, because this allows investors uh, to, pro to apply text analysis to the data rather than, as they do today, having to resort to the paper version. But let me just make it clear, it's not just the MDNA that we would like uh, structured. We would really like it to apply, we would like structuring to apply to all regulatory filings, uh, not just the NK, but the 8K and everything else. Okay, what, what specifically, what, what specific types of data would you like to see? I mean, you said it to apply to all regulatory filings. Is, are there specific pieces of information that you think would be helpful for investors if it was in tagged or structured format? Um, I'm going to get to our, uh, uh, when I get to the vision section, I will, I'll be talking about that. How, how, and I, and, I, and um, so I think I'll just wait for, until we get to that point. Okay, okay, that's great. great. Okay, um, I also want to ask you about the SEC's Disclosure Effectiveness Initiative. Um, this is a, a program that the SEC put in place where the Division of Corporation Finance is reviewing requirements for disclosure in both Regulation SK and Regulation SX, um, which covers you know, financial statement disclosure requirements, and they're looking for ways to improve disclosure, both for the benefit of companies as well as the benefit of investors. Um, this, this program has really spawned a lot of different proposed changes, and in some cases, final rulings. Um, why do you think the SEC initiated these activities, and what is your view on these activities at this point in time? Well, I think that, the, well, I, I, I know that this all started when there was a lot of pressure from companies about uh, the about disclosure overload and the compliance costs that companies were um, having to bear. And, and I, as I talked about earlier, there was a lot of pushback from investors saying that we're not suffering from disclosure overload. What we want are more effective disclosures. And I think that's when the narrative changed to effectiveness uh, versus overload, and, and we hope that we played some part in, in changing that narrative. We certainly, uh, uh, we certainly support a disclosure effectiveness uh, initiative. Um, as you know, that um, the uh, SEC has recently released its concept uh, release on Regulation SK, which is 
which relates to disclosures outside of the financial statements, and we, we did respond to it. Um, one of the things that we said is that uh, we, we, uh, we pushed for structuring uh, outside of the financial statements, but we were um, a little concerned that many of the questions in the concept release, um, it, it seemed as if we were still stuck in a paper paradigm. Uh, there were a lot of questions about costs, compliance costs for companies, and there were questions about things like, you know, should uh, should we disclose the last uh, five years or the last three years of information? Uh, is this going to be burdensome for uh, for companies? And we seem to be missing what what uh, you know the point that technology can be used to relieve that burden, and and we don't seem to be leveraging that to the to the level that we should. Um, recently, the SEC also came up uh, with its technical re release after its concept release. We, we haven't responded to that yet. We will be late in, in responding. Um, that, for, for the investor community, I have to say, was a, we, we saw it as a rather inscrutable document because uh, we are not uh, the preparer community, and we are not auditors, and we are not as au fait as those communities with detailed SEC regulations. So it's very diff difficult as investors for us to stand back and say, if you were to make all of these changes, what would the end result be? What, what would the landscape actually look like? And so one of the recommendations we're going to make is that, you know, if, if you're going to put out such a detailed study, you really should form focus groups uh, to start answering some of those questions. Right, I think that makes a lot of sense, certainly given the uh, 500 page length of many of these uh, well, many of these proposals and rules, which, uh, which make it a little bit difficult to slog through them. And the two of them have come out back to back, so it's really, it, 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 it's a lot for us to take in. Exactly, exactly, we, we do the same. Uh, so I, can, I can commiserate with you on that. Um, okay, I have a, a, another question for you before we move on to CPE questions. Um, I just want to talk to you about the Experial US Data Quality Committee. Um, you are, are a member of the data, data Quality Committee. Can you tell us about this organization and the work that, it, that it's doing today? Um, and do you think that it's going to help issuers create better quality financials? And how important is that for investors? Well, actually, um, I would suggest that you go on to your CPE questions because this sets me up perfectly for my next um, slide. Oh, okay. I was going to talk about the challenges that we're facing uh, in the implementation of XBRL and mm -hmm. what the committee is doing uh, in terms of addressing those challenges. Great. Okay. Um, and I also just want to remind everyone that you can submit questions yourselves by clicking on the Q&A link. Um, we're not going to take those questions until um, the end of the program, but you can you can submit them right now. So why don't we go on and take our first CPE question, and I'm going to stop sharing now so that uh, my colleague can bring up the questions. And we're going to have two two different CPE questions. Okay, and I am not seeing the CPE question. So, uh, David, if you're seeing it, if you could just go ahead and speak speak to it. Uh, sure, Michelle. Uh, the first CPE question in the CFA study: What other kinds of data are not currently in structured format, but would be helpful for analysts if it was in structured format? MDNA, financial statement data or financial statement data, financial data embedded in the footnotes. That's the first of two CPE questions at the point in the presentation. Um, let me give you just another couple of seconds. All right, thanks to those of you that uh, participated for CPE today. Uh, the second polling question, the SEC's Disclosure Effectiveness Initiative is led by the SEC's Division of Enforcement or designed to review Regulation SK and Regulation SX requirements for financial statements or designed to improve corporate reporting 
to non-SEC agencies. Choose from those three options. And again, just a couple more seconds. For those of you that are qualifying for CPE, please uh, choose one of those three options. All right, we're gonna end the polling there. Michelle, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Great, thanks, David. Okay, we're now going to, I'm gonna share my screen again. And we're going to go on with our presentation. So Mahini, I'm gonna turn it over to you again. I don't see the slide, Michelle. Okay. Let me just reshare there. Uh, Michelle, this is David. Go ahead and try it again. I'm trying to find the right screen here. Sorry, just uh, just bear with us here. David, for some reason, I'm not able to pull up that particular screen. So is there, is there a way that you could share your screen and show the slides? Yep, let me know if that's working. Great, could we go to slide 12, please? Sure. Thank you. Challenges. As with other technologies, we have been experiencing growing pains in the implementation of XBRL. Chief amongst the challenges, as I've already mentioned, is that companies see XBRL as a compliance exercise. Another challenge, particularly in the US, is the quality of the data. Data quality issues analysis of data by investors. And this prevents companies from improving communication with investors. We are actually working on addressing these quality issues. XPRL US has formed a data quality committee. And as Michelle just mentioned, CFA Institute is a member of the committee. The committee develops guidance and validation rules for companies that will help them detect errors in XPRL data filed with the SEC. We hope this will improve the usability of the data. The committee has released its first set of validation rules. We conducted an analysis to measure the effectiveness of these rules. It enabled validation of more than 1.9 million data points in the first quarter of 2016. The rules identify potential errors, such as incorrect negative values that you can see in the green there, and incorrect dates. The results are really quite impressive. Errors for all SEC filers were reduced by 64% for the data covered by the rules. 
there was a 70% decrease in the number of errors for accelerated filers, and smaller reporting companies had a 60% decrease. We are very heartened by the results and encourage more companies to follow the validation rules. They are, of course, freely available. And we will continue to develop validation rules. Um, the committee is also working on a discussion document that proposes a framework for element selection and extension use. The application guidance will cover items on the balance sheet and the income statement. And it'll be the first in a series on application guidance under the framework. The framework consists of guiding, guiding principles for element selection, such as extension use must be limited to defined specific cases and in those cases, extensions must be connected to standard elements in a manner that enables useful machine-readable interpretation of the extension. Another one, that the location of a disclosure in the printed financial statements is not relevant to element selection. In fact, we found that a number of extensions are created so that the machine readable format re replicates the paper format. Next slide, please. Uh, we have said in our paper that policymakers need to embrace the advancements in data and technology in their decision making process. As I just said, when reviewing the SEC's concept release on SK, it felt as if we were still stuck in a paper paradigm. From companies, regulators hear about increasing compliance costs. From users, they hear about the need for more good quality information. We need to think about how technology can help achieve both. I'm just gonna share a few of our views on the concept release. Enhance the value of disclosures by applying structuring to beyond the financial statements and footnotes. Provide investors with equal and consistent access to data from all companies, big and small. Improve the quality of data by acknowledging and adopting the rules and guidance set by the Data, quali data Quality Committee. Require extensions be connected to a tag in the base taxonomy so that they can be machine readable. Support auditor involvement to provide assurance on the structured data. We also believe that increased SEC enforcement would go a long way in improving data quality because currently companies don't really face any consequences if they submit poor quality data. The SEC's other big initiative is the Edgar Redesign Project, which we thoroughly support. Investors <clears throat> would certainly benefit from having access to data that is more easily searchable. At the moment, it can be a challenge to find a specific piece of data within a filing. It's even more difficult for investors to establish trend lines or compare the performance of one company to that of another. Analysts need to be able to slice the dice and dice data in different ways to co compare multiple companies or conduct other research. Commissioner Stein of the SEC has propagated the layering of the data in order to make it easier to navigate. We agree with her, in fact, we propagated that very view in our 2013 report on financial reporting disclosures. Data visualization tools, such as graphics and helpful summaries, would also improve search and filtering capabilities and highlight the changes from previous filings. Remember, investors are always looking for the delta. 
these improvements would greatly improve, increase the usefulness of data for investors. As you know, at the moment, investors can provide vendors can provide information in a way that helps analysts mine mountains of data with just a few keystrokes. Next slide. <clears throat> the last chapter of our report talks about our vision for the future. That is the broader and deeper use of structured data. We have already talked about making structured data better and easier to use. The next step is how to expand its use. This, I believe, will require the combined efforts of the public and private sectors. Structured reporting is most effective when it is applied broadly to all prospective reporting, that is, to earnings releases, all regulatory filings, proxy sta statements, tax reporting, and so forth. And structuring needs to apply to all companies, big and small. <clears throat> this is efficient for investors who invest across all sorts of companies. It also potentially brings greater investment for small quantities, since analysts will have greater access to their data. The Herb Bill that proposed a $250 million revenue threshold would have exempted 3,800 US companies from XBRL filings. This would have been, we believe, a huge step backward. Furthermore, <coughs> regulators need to require structured reporting beyond financial statements by applying structuring to all reports in their entirety, which will allow investors a deeper look into annual and other reports, including the notes and management commentary. If structuring is applied only to the face of the financial statements, or only to annual, not interim reports, then frankly, investors would just use the PDF. That is why we have urged in a comment letter to the European Securities and Markets Authority to expand their requirements for structuring, or else this will be a wasted opportunity. In fact, some taxonomies have already been developed to cover the MDNA, audit reports, and corporate actions. Some are still to be developed, such as to cover integrated reporting. Questions remain as to how do we incentivize all parties in the financial reporting chain towards this goal? And how far are we from making this a reality? <clears throat> While we may be a ways away from this, what we should really aspire toward is standardized business reporting like the Australian government. SBR is a key infrastructure which can be reused in many ways. The ability of SBR standards to be applied to intergovernmental communications allows for tell once, share with many models of interaction. When information is provided to one agency, the infrastructure allows automated distribution of that information to other relevant agencies. This is a proven solution for business to government interaction as well as business to business. For instance, it is delivering savings for the superannuation sector as it replaces time consuming manual proof of identity processes. In fact, 
a twist 2016 Australia SBR board meeting report and three year plan claims $1 billion in savings to private sector government compliance costs for the year 2015 2016. Let, let me repeat that that's $1.1 billion. That's huge. Next slide, please. <clears throat> In the report, I refer to our XPRL survey results from 2011. We have just finished with a follow-up to that survey, and I'd like to share some of the results. <clears throat> Here is a regional distribution of respondents. As you can see, 60% were from the Americas, 24% from EMEA, and 16% from the Asia Pacific region. I have to say that the, uh, that the number of respondents were uh, uh, discouragingly low. I believe there were about 362 when we had uh, sent the survey out to 25,000 members. Next slide. First, we asked members about which financial reporting attributes were important to them. We asked them to rank the importance of the following attributes. Reliability, consistency, comparability, timeliness, granularity. Not surprisingly, respondents felt that all these attributes were important, with reliability being the most important. And we asked why these attributes were important. Here are some of the responses. If the data isn't reliable, then it is actually worse than no data. It must, must also be granular enough and consistent to be useful. Not sure this needs explanation. The characteristics you've listed here are the core tenets of quality financial reporting that have been for years. And one respondent simply said, duh. Next slide. The next question was about awareness of XBRL initiatives. 55% of respondents remain unaware of XPRL. And the 30 and 35% who are aware are not up to date on its usage in financial reporting. That's a whopping 90%. Next slide. In fact, I found an animation, a conversation between Mr. Suzuki and Mr. Sato created by the Japanese Institute of CPAs that educates on the usage and benefits of XPRL. It's really rather good. I'll share a few more results. Of those aware of XPRL, the highest proportions agree that XPRL tagged interactive data will have the most significant improvement on their ability to increase the timeliness of the valuation process and to upload company data into their financial analysis models. 77% of respondents rated tagged information for all companies across a meaningful set of annual and interim periods as important for their use of XPRL file information. We also asked about sources of obtaining company data. 48% said they obtain most of their data that is used in their analysis of companies from third-party data providers with a limited amount of data extracted manually from filings. 10% of respondents obtain all of their data from third-party providers. So what are these results telling us? Primarily, 
that companies are not using structured data as a communication platform. This is reflected in the fact that they are tagging only where they are required to and not beyond. That they are tagging at the end of the financial reporting for the compliance process purposes. And it is unfortunately, unfortunately reflected in the poor data quality. Companies are not giving analysts a reason to embrace XPRL or to change their current practices. And so analysts continue to rely on data providers. Net users want better quality information is reflected in the following two results. Next slide, please. Fifty-six percent of respondents said that companies should have limited ability to create new tags in order to reflect unique business activities or transactions not defined by the current XBRL taxonomy. Next slide. 50% supported incorporating the XPRL report into the standard financial statement audit to ensure the appropriateness of the tagging of reported amounts. Sorry, we've gone back. We need slide 20. Thank you. I'll just quickly repeat that. So 50% wanted to incorporate the XPRL into the standard financial statement audit. Another 22% wanted it audited, but as a part of a separate engagement, not the standard audit. Basically, what this is telling us is that analysts want few extensions and they want assurance on the tagged data. Finally, 83% of respondents who are aware of XBRL thought it important to receive the information from the regulator for free. 64% think it is important for third party providers to provide it for free. I really doubt that that's gonna happen anytime soon, but clearly our members believe in the democratization of information. Next slide. <clears throat> so what are the takeaways? Education of all parties is, is essential. But for progress to truly be made, it starts with the companies. Companies need to recognize the benefits of data and technology, both in terms of internal benefits and better communication with investors. Demand from companies for better assurance services will also spur the audit community. And data and technology need to be embraced by policymakers, both in their decision-making processes, as well as enforcement. As the survey results show, education of investors is equally important. And investors need to become more involved in this discussion. The onus is on us to do that. If all these pieces fall into place, this could be a win-win for all parties. Finally, in the words of Eric Schmidt, and I have no idea as to ask the accuracy of this statement. Every two days, we create as much information as we did from the dawn of civilization until 2003. As I said, I have no idea about the accuracy of this statement, but clearly data and technology are here to stay. Next slide, please. If you would like to access the blog that introduces the report or download, download the report itself, here are the links to do so. Thank you so much for your time.
Mohini, thank you. That was that was really interesting. Um, and uh, I think now we're going to go to uh, a couple of questions. And we've received some questions from the audience, and I ha also have some questions that I'd like to like to pose. Sure. So we're going to pull those up on the slides now. And then we also have some CPE questions too. Okay. So, um, so my my first question, just building on the the comments that you provided. Um, you know, there, there has been some concern among public companies. You talked a lot about public companies and how they need to take a different approach to this. But there's been some concerns that they've expressed about creating experial financials, um, but, but concerns that, that the investors of these companies and um, their sell side analysts who cover them don't actually seem to be accessing the experial files off their website. You know, they're required to, to post their experial files. This leads them to believe that no one is using the experial formatted data. So my question is for you, how do most analysts use corporate financials today? And would they be aware that they're accessing data that was pulled from the company's experial filing? Well, as you saw, it's a great question, Michelle. As you saw from um, uh, the survey results, uh, you're right. They aren't going to the filings themselves. At least the majority of respondents aren't going to the filings themselves to extract the XBRL data. I believe that that has a lot to do with the quality issues that we've, we've been discussing. And again, as the, uh, um, as the survey results show you, that the way that they're using the data is to go to the service uh, to, to the data providers and, uh, and obtain the data from them. But the data providers, interestingly enough, are actually getting the data from the filings, a lot of it. And then what they're doing is cleaning up or normalizing the data before they, before they give it to their customers. So yes, a lot of analysts may well be actually using XBRL data without ever realizing it. Right, now that makes a lot of sense because obviously they're using tools like, they're using you know, Bloomberg or FactSet or, or Morningstar and you gave the example of with Morningstar how much, much easier it is for them to process the data when it's an XBRL format. So that's, that's good to know. Um, and I, in fact, one of the gentlemen on, on the data quality committee is from Bloomberg, and he has confirmed that they use a lot of XBRL data. Right, right, okay. Um, then um, the other question that I have that, um, that, that we were going to, to touch on before was, um, you know, as a member of the data quality committee, you know, how do you, what do you think about the work that they're doing? And do you think that it's actually going to help issuers create better quality data? Absolutely. Um, as I said, the, the first set of validation rules had excellent results. Um, uh, the, 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 the trick over here, of course, is uh, to continue to encourage companies to use it. And if we, and we, we strongly, the committee strongly feels that if there's some sort of endorsement of the validation rules by the SEC, that would that would be a big step towards uh, uh, urging companies to follow the validation rules. Uh, the other element of, of what we're doing is, of course, uh, uh, developing that framework on the use of extensions. As, as Mike Starr, uh, uh, who is the chair of the Data Quality Committee, often says that the US is the wild, wild west of extensions. Um, and indeed, at, at the drop of a hat, companies, if they can't find the right tag, just create an extension, and that's very harmful for investors uh, in their analysis because that is no longer machine readable. So we need to encourage companies to also follow the framework to curb the number of extensions that are created. Now, there's been a lot of debate on the subject whether, you know, should we just eliminate the use of extensions? We, CFA Institute, would never go there because we totally believe that information needs to be comparable, mm -hmm. but we also very strongly believe that if a company has a very unique story to tell, they must be able to tell it. So there, there is that balance between comparability and transparency, and it's, and it's a very difficult balance to achieve as, we, as we're finding in our discussions on the committee. But so what, what we're going to try to achieve is limiting the use of extensions to those very unique circumstances where the company really just has to tell its own unique entity specific story. Right, no, that makes a lot of sense. 
Um, let's let's go to um, the last question I have, which um, if we can go to, to slide six now, it relates to the House Financial Services Committee um, bill that was it was a, it was a pat it was a bill that was recently passed through the House Financial Services Committee called Financial Choice. And the Financial Choice Act aims to, to improve access to capital for public companies, and it includes regulation of financial institutions, it includes holding Wall Street accountable. But one of the other provisions of the bill is an exemption for small companies from filing in XBRL. And um, the, the vision behind this is that it's going to um, reduce the burden on small companies. So I want you to know, um, does the CFA Institute have a view on eliminating structured data for, for small companies? Do you think that this would improve small company access to funds in the public markets? Uh, absolutely. We are completely against uh, eliminated structured data for small companies. And no, we do not believe that it, it, it would improve access to funds because it actually reduces investors' access to their data and their ability to analyze it. Um, in fact, I think the only way that they would be able to access greater funds, and it's actually in their interest to do so, is by structuring their data. That would draw investors to them. Great. And, and one of the other um, points that has been made about this exemption is that it would be optional so that a small company could choose to file in extra format if they wanted to. Do you think that that is a, a good move to make? Do you think that companies would actually choose to file an XBRL if they had the option to, to not file an XBRL? To be honest, I really doubt that they would choose to um, file an XBRL. And, and the reason is, I think, because they are too focused on the cost instead of the potential benefits that might come to them. And that's where a lot of education is required. Okay, and I know we're running out of time here, but just one last question that we received from, uh, from the audience um, is, how can financial analysts access XBRL data if they don't have the technical expertise to, to use it directly? And I think that you may have gotten to this to some extent when you're talking about the data providers, but, but maybe you can expand on that a little bit, Mahini. Um, I, I don't think it's the technical expertise to use the data that is the issue. I think it's the quality of the data that is the issue because they are, in fact, using the data that the providers are providing them with. And um, uh, in many cases, some of the providers are getting 40% of their data from the XBRL filings. So it's not the technical use of the data, it's the quality of the data. So unfortunately now, you know, the data isn't truly democratized because it has to go through the providers who clean it up, normalize it, and then sell it to analysts. Right, right, okay. Okay, well listen, I wanna, um, I, I think we need to, to wrap up and go on to CPE questions now. Um, Mohini, I wanna thank you so much for um, your talk today. I think it was really helpful, really interesting, and, and really clarified a lot of issues related to investor use of structured data. Um, and, and I want to thank our audience for joining us, but let's, let's go to our, our final two CPE questions, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, David, now. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Uh, next question. Uh, the work of the Data Quality Committee is to, your choices are, develop guidance and rules to help issuers detect and correct XBRL, or explore additional areas where structured data can be of use or provide education and training on how to create good quality XBRL? Take just another couple of seconds to respond to that CPE question. And then I'm gonna switch it quickly to the last CPE question. The Financial Choice Act. Your choices are uh, one, was passed by the full House of Representatives, or it includes a provision that would exempt all public companies from filing an XBRL, or it includes a provision that would exempt small public companies from filing an XBRL. And again, for those of you that are qualifying for CPE related to today's session, please make your choice quickly. And I'm gonna end the polling and turn it right back to Michelle. David, thank you. 
Um, and thanks again to everybody for joining us today. Um, this event has been recorded and we'll be sending out the replay to the program tomorrow so that if you have other people that are interested in it, you can forward it on to them. And again, um, I want to thank Mohini Singh from the CFA Institute for uh, presenting the findings from their survey. And that survey can also be found um, online and, and we will send out a link, to, uh, not a survey, study. Um, we will send out a link to the study itself so that you can have access to that directly. So thanks again, and we'll see you at our next webinar, probably sometime next month. Thank you.